This lecture for Introduction to Environmental Science will cover the unit on non-renewable energy, which includes the fossil fuels, including coal, natural gas, and petroleum, as well as nuclear energy. In the case studies, when we talk about fossil fuels in particular and petroleum, is whether or not we should drill in an area in Alaska known as the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, or ANWR, as it's known for short. This is an area that has been set aside as a wildlife refuge. However, if authorized by Congress, drilling could begin there. Proponents of drilling say that there is substantial oil there and it would help meet the energy needs of the United States. Opponents, however, contend that this drilling will impact uh, some key breeding areas for caribou and other wildlife, and that its impact on the price that uh, the average American will pay at the pump is actually minimal. So what do we mean by Anwar to begin with? Well, there are actually three regi regions in Alaska's North Slope. The first is called the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, which contains 23 million acres that originally were to be, remain untapped unless we face an emergency. In recent years, however, there has been drilling going on there and there is pressure to expand the drilling despite it containing key caribou and waterfowl breeding areas. The second region is the Prudhoe Bay, which is an area that has seen active drilling for oil for several decades now, and it is where the Trans-Alaska Pipeline brings oil down from the North Slope to the Port of Valdez. The third region is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is federal land that was set aside for wildlife to preserve pristine ecosystems. And this is what it looks like. This blue area here in Prudhoe Bay was the region that people estimated would be drilled in 1972. This purple line surrounding this region here represents the area that has received actual oil development. And you can see it has extended into the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. And this green area is Anwar. And this small area here of the 1002 area is the area that has been targeted for drilling. So, it is a fact of life that our society needs energy. We need it to power all of our machinery, our vehicles, and all the comfort and conveniences from our cars to our iPods and iPads that make our modern society work. One of the main sources of energy is uh, fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are combustible substances that are formed from the remains of organisms that under tremendous heat and pressure were transformed into what we call coal, oil, or natural gas today. And for the most part, our modern society is powered by fossil fuels. We use these in a large quantity. They are used for transportation, heating, and cooking, as well as the generating of electricity. There are also what we call renewable sources of energy, which we will talk about in a later unit. Renewable energy are those supplies of energy that will not be depleted by our continual use, such as sunlight, geothermal energy, and tidal energy. Non-renewable energy, on the other hand, are sources of energy that are finite and in a matter of time, could be decades, could be centuries, they will run out. And these include the fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear energy, which although not a fossil fuel, is still a non-renewable source of energy. All of these forms of energy will eventually be depleted within the measurable time of human activity. Fossil fuels, 
as the name implies, are formed from the remains of dead organisms, mostly plant organisms that were buried under sediments millions of years ago under tremendous heat and pressure and the breakdown of this material through bacterial action. Eventually this material gets converted into one of these forms of fossil fuel. Fossil fuels are all over the world, although they are not evenly distributed. Some regions in the world have substantial reserves of one or more fossil fuel. Others are very poor in all three of them. For example, nearly 67%, two thirds of the world's proven reserves of crude oil are in the Middle East. Russia contains the largest reserves of natural gas, while the United States has the largest coal reserves. And this table from your text just illustrates the countries with the largest reserves of these three fossil fuels. Use of fossil fuels is, are, is also unevenly distributed. Developed countries, the wealthy industrialized countries consume a lot more energy than developing nations. And these uses are divided among transportation, industry, and other uses such as the generating of electricity. Developing nations often use these sources of energy for more subsistence level activities, including agriculture, food preparation, and heating. Things to keep in mind when we are looking at energy sources is any source of energy requires an investment of energy to obtain the source of energy. We don't get anything for nothing in this world. This is true from the laws of thermodynamics as well as the laws of economics. We have to expend resources to build roads drill wells, construct and operate vehicles to transport these materials, these fuels to where we can use them. And often the, these sources of energies need a large amount of processing before they're ready to be used as a source of energy. So in terms of the value of an energy source, one way to measurement, measure it is to look at the net energy, which is the energy return, that is the energy generated through the consumption of this resource, minus the energy invested in obtaining and processing it. Another factor, another way to measure the value of a source of energy is what's known as the energy return on investment, or EROI which is the energy return divided by the energy invested. Fossil fuels in general have a very high EROI. However, as we've depleted a lot of the easy to obtain deposits of many of these sources of energy, the EROI tends to decline over time. For example, in the 1940s, the energy return on investment for petroleum was 100 to 1. A way of looking at is for every barrel equivalent of energy that was invested in pumping oil out of the ground and processing and transporting it, we received 100 barrels of oil equivalent in energy on a return. Today, that ratio has been reduced down to five to one. So it's been a 20 fold drop in the energy return on, on investment over the past 70 years. We're we'll talk specifically about coal. Coal is a solid organic material that is formed from the compression of plant uh, material under the tremendous heat and pressure of sediments that have piled up on top of it millions of years ago. Coal has a very high energy content and is used widely for a variety of sources of energy. However, one of the big drawbacks to coal is it contains numerous impurities, including sulfur, 
which contributes to acid rain, mercury and arsenic and other trace metals, which can also add to air and water pollutants. High sulfur coal, also known as hard or anthracite coal, is found mainly in the eastern US and in particular in the northeastern corner of Pennsylvania. Lower sulfur or softer coal, also known as bituminous coal, is mined in the southwestern corner of Pennsylvania to this day. And these other pollutants can cause numerous other problems, including bioaccumulation of mercury, which can make its way through the food chain, rendering, among other sources of food, fish harvested from rivers hazardous to eat. There are two main methods to mine coal. One is strip mining, where the overburden or the layer of soil and rock over top of the coal is stripped away using power equipment, or subsurface mining, where tunnels are dug into the ground to bring the coal up to the surface that way. The first uses of coal were for heating people's homes and running steam engines, including steam powered locomotives and steam ships. Today, the primary use of coal is to generate electricity. Coal is burned to boil water into steam, which is then used to turn a turbine. This table illustrates some of the biggest consumers and producers of coal. And as you can see, China and the United States ranked high in both the production and consumption of coal. And this is a schematic of a typical coal burning power plant. The coal is brought into a bunker where it is pulverized into a finer power powder it is then burned in the furnace. The heat is then used to boil water and the force of the escaping steam powers our turbo generator to generate electricity. The steam is then recondensed back into liquid water through the cooling loop and the heat is transferred to the cooling loop and then disposed of in some manner such as this cooling tower. Now these towers Many people associate this tower shape with nuclear power plants. However, this type of cooling structure is actually very common throughout a number of types of power plants that need to transfer heat from the steam and remove it from the power plant. The recondensed water is then fed back into the boiler to be boiled again. Now, as coal generates large quantities of air pollutants, there needs to be some type of filtration system to capture the air pollutants, and these become part of the ash waste that is usually disposed of in a landfill or some other disposal method as a waste product. Now, you might have seen advertisements on TV talking about clean coal. What do we mean by clean coal? Uh, this cartoon kind of pokes fun at this, the idea that you can just polish each lump of coal and make it clean that way. But in reality, clean coal means making some attempt to reduce the emissions of a variety of pollutants. And in recent years, research has been conducted to try and reduce not only pollutants like sulfur and mercury emissions from power plants, but also carbon dioxide emission. And this schematic illustrates one way in which carbon dioxide could be captured and then fed back into the airflow of the furnace and burned away in the furnace and then captured as part of the ash. So this is one possibility of capturing the CO2. Other methods might involve pumping the CO2 underground and capturing it that way. Now, Pennsylvania uh, has the rather dubious distinction of being the state with the longest burning underground coal fire 
And this is in the town that uh, formerly was known as Centralia. This borough has, however, uh, been dissolved a number of years ago, but there are a number of residents who still stay in this region. In the 1960s, a tire fire slid into a coal mine shaft in, in underneath the town and ignited the coal underground. And all efforts to put out this fire have failed. They have tried flooding the, the uh, shafts with water. They've tried cutting off the oxygen. Um, and none of that has succeeded. And the fire continues to burn today and will probably burn for another 50 years or more. In 1984, Congress allocated funds to, under eminent domain, to uh, buy people's homes and relocate them. This brought the population of the former borough of Centralia down from its peak of 1,000 residents to nine. And those nine people still live there today. And here we see an aerial shot of what Centralia looks like. This was the main drag in Centralia here. And here you can see some of the remaining homes. These used to be part of a whole block of row homes. Most of them have now been turn, torn down. And you can also see the smoke coming up out of the ground from the burning coal fire. Now, natural gas is another fossil fuel. And this is the source of energy among the fossil fuels that is growing the fastest these days. Right now, it accounts for about a quarter of the global commercial energy consumption. Natural gas consists mostly of methane. However, it does contain traces of other hydrocarbons. There are two ways in which methane and these other hydrocarbons can form. One is through a biogenic process where bacteria in an anaerobic environment, that is to say a very oxygen poor environment, uh, the bacteria breaks down and decomposes this organic material. This often occurs in shallow waters and swamps. And you might see, if you travel through these swampy regions, you might see bubbles coming up from the surface of the water. And this is what they call swamp gas, which is, again, a form of methane formed from the bacterial decomposition of dead organic material. The other way in which methane is formed is through compression and heat of dead organic material deep underground, usually forming a of, above a deposit of coal or petroleum. And this thermogenic gas is what we usually mean when we refer to natural gas. And here we have the biggest producers and consumers of natural gas. And once again, we can see while the US rates pretty high on Production, Russia leads the world in natural gas production, and the U.S. is the biggest consumer of it. Now, one of the problems we're facing with natural gas these days is that the production of it is getting more and more difficult. Most of the really easy-to-tap sources of natural gas have already been depleted. Natural gas, you have to keep in mind, is not trapped in a little pocket or an underground cave in, in the bedrock. It is actually inside little tiny pores in porous bedrock. So it is trapped inside the rock. And the way in which we get the natural gas out once the initial easy to obtain natural gas just escapes outward is it has to be pumped. And this usually involves uh, pumping salt water or some other fluid into the rocks. And the growing technique that is becoming increasingly used is known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking for short, 
where a salt water solution is pumped into the rocks to fracture or crack them open and force the gas out. This is a photograph of a natural gas drilling operation. And this is a schematic of a fracking operation that is being developed in the Marcellus Shale. The Marcellus Shale is a geologic formation, uh, the largest region of which is underneath Pennsylvania. And there is tremendous effort to step up and increase the amount of drilling for natural gas in, in particular, western and northern Pennsylvania, where some new fracking methods have made the tapping of the Marcellus Shale economically viable. And again, this means pumping a solution of salt water that contains some other uh, proprietary additives and using this to fracture or crack open the rocks in the Marcellus Shale and force the natural gas out. Uh, many uh, critics of this fracking method are concerned in particular about many of the contaminants that end up in this fracking water and the potential it might have for contaminating the groundwater in the region. Natural gas is often used to generate electricity for heating and for cooking in homes. However, it is also increasingly being used to power vehicles, in particular, city buses. Many municipalities, including Center County in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, New York City have begun adopting more and more natural gas powered vehicles for their bus fleet. These vehicles have fewer pollutants associated with them than diesel powered buses, so they are considered a cleaner, I'm not going to call them a clean fuel, but I will say they are cleaner than many other sources of energy for vehicles. Much of our natural gas these days is produced from drilling on offshore platforms. Uh, and this can have some concerns about safety as well, uh, in term, particularly in terms of hurricanes hitting drilling platforms and the impact it have on the environment and the price of natural gas. Now, our third main source of fossil fuels is petroleum or crude oil, also sometimes called Texas Key, Black Gold. I won't sing the entire theme song from the Beverly Hillbillies, but you get the idea. Oil is the world's most used fuel, and it is a liquid fossil fuel. And it is formed just like natural gas and coal by dead organic material buried under sediments and then transformed over time by heat and pressure into petroleum. And here are the top producers and consumers of oil. And probably not surprising, the biggest producer is Saudi Arabia. Well, the biggest consumer, consuming almost a quarter of the world's petroleum, is the United States. Petroleum occurs in isolated deposits. It's only found in relatively rare instances. Um, there are estimates, including the uh, deposits in ground in various locations, Estimates for the deposits in Anwar vary from between 11.6 and 31.5 billion barrels. And barrel is usually the unit they use when they're discussing oil production. It's about 40 gallons. The average of this 2.7 billion barrels could consume, could meet our consumption rate at our current levels for about 33 months, so a little under three years. However, 
even if all that oil um, is there based on estimates, the reality is we couldn't get all out of it. Based on technology and economic viability, only about 7.7 .7 billion bar barrels are what we call technically recoverable, which means based on current drilling and pump pumping technology, that's as much as we could draw out. So if we could pull all that oil out of Anwar, 7.7 .7 billion barrels in one gigantic slurp, that would need our need for petroleum uh, for about one year. That's if we could pull it all out in one big gigantic slurp, as I said. And the reality is, well, we can't pull it all out at once. It will take us 30 years or more to pump the uh, oil out of the ground. So we can't even pull it out at one big slurp, as they say. Here we have a picture of an oil well. You can see the initial gusher. And if you've ever seen movies like They Might Be Blood or any other show where they're talking about drooling for oil, um, you know, they usually have the scene where they hit the gusher. And this is what happens when you first tap into a deposit of oil. You drill until you hit the oil deposit. And then as you release some of that pressure, when you tap into it, some of the oil is forced out. That's great. However, like natural gas, oil is not just sitting in an underground lake or an you know, underground cave or opening in the ground, uh, open space or anything. It is trapped in between you know, the pores in the bedrock. So it is trapped inside the rock. And eventually that pressure release from drilling, that initial tap that you do, uh, is going to even out and the oil is no longer going to gush out like you see there. And instead, just like natural gas, in order to keep the oil coming out of this source, you have to pump it. And the schematic on the right there shows a typical oil pump where once again a fluid is forced into the bedrock to pump the petroleum out. Also, as I said, not all oil can be extracted. Uh, based on current pumping and drilling technology, only a certain amount of oil in each reserve, each source can actually be pumped out. Often they call this the proven recoverable reserve. This includes the amount of oil that is both technically and economically feasible to remove. Now, technology will tell you how much oil you can physically pump out of the ground. This is how much, based on current pumping technology, you could remove. However, just because you can remove the oil doesn't mean that it is profitable to do so. And what happens with many older oil wells is over time, it takes more and more effort and therefore more and more money to pump out an ever diminishing supply of oil. So therefore there reaches a point where a well no longer becomes commercially viable to continue operating. So for example, if you have an old well and it's costing you $50 a barrel to pump oil out of this well, and the current price of oil is $45 a barrel. Are you going to keep pumping that well? Of course not. You're going to be losing $5 every barrel. No business could stay afloat with that type of loss. So when prices are low, these older wells get shut down. What happens though when the price of oil rises? Let's say there's a big shortage and the price of oil doubles to 100 barrels of oil. Now your older well is profitable. It still only cost you 50 bucks a barrel to pump it out, but you can sell it for $100 a barrel, so you're doubling your money. With a $50 investment, selling it for $100 a barrel, you're making $50 a barrel profit. 
So when prices are high, older wells get reopened. When they're low, they, these older wells that are more expensive to operate get shut down. So we drill to get oil out of the ground and we use it for a lot of things. But first, it needs to be refined. It needs to be processed. All the different hydrocarbons within a typical barrel of oil need to be separated out. Oil itself, what we call crude oil or petroleum, is a real mixed soup of different types of hydrocarbons. And they have to be separated because some have uses for vehicle fuels, others could be used for making plastics or for lubricants. So we have to separate these out. And this process is called refining. So you bring the petroleum to a refiner, which is basically a big distillation column. The oil is heated, and then the various hydrocarbons are separated out by their weight and their different boiling temperatures. The really light hydrocarbons like butane, which have very low boiling temperatures, float to the top and are brought out here. And then you can see some others like gasoline here in the middle and kerosene, diesel. And then you get to some of the heavier hydrocarbons like lubricating oil. And then there's a tarry residue that is collected in the bottom. And we use petroleum products for a variety of things, not just powering vehicles, but also making a whole host of consumer goods. So as we use petroleum, as we think about what we use it for, it's not just a source of energy, but it's also a raw material to be used for manufacturing many products that we use in our everyday lives. So as we consume oil, and remember that it is a non-renewable resource, and that means eventually it will run out. This is a simple fact. And by many estimates, already half of the world's reserves have been depleted. By many estimates, 1.1 trillion barrels of oil have already been consumed. Every country that produces petroleum has what they know as a reserves to production, production ratio. This is the amount of the total remaining reserves, what's still in the ground, divided by their annual rate of production, how much is being pumped out of the ground and processed. Based on current estimates uh, of the current global production of about 30 billion barrels per year, we have about 40 years of oil left. And once it's gone, it's gone. And the RP ratio of many countries is difficult to estimate because many countries keep it secret. So we are facing an oil shortage in the coming century. And in, by the mid-century, we may be seeing the end of the petroleum era. And in many cases, we have already depleted over half of the reserves in many countries' uh, production. And they call this Hubbard's Peak after a geologist who predicted that the US oil production would peak around 1970. And it was fairly accurate. It was about 73 when production peaked. And some estimates say that we may have already peaked global production or we are right on the verge of peaking today. Uh, but because many companies and governments keep uh, their production and supplies a secret. Uh, we're not really sure, and we might not know about this till several years later. And here we have a line graph showing U.S. oil production peaking once again in the early 70s. And that is when the U.S. Became a net importer of oil. We no longer produced enough petroleum to meet our demand. As I said, it, by many estimates, global oil production may have already peaked or it 
we're right about peaking today. We are not discovering many new oil fields. All we're doing is extracting and consuming the ones that we know about. And this is one of the reasons why we were drilling so deep in the Gulf of Mexico when that accident occurred in 2010. The reasons why we were drilling in water that deep was because many of the deposits closer to land in shallower water have already been depleted. So uh, this is the reality. If we want to meet our petroleum demand at its current levels, uh, this, the uh, factors are going to force us to drill in areas that are risky and in many cases, very difficult to get to. Some of the consequences of peak oil. Well, production will slow down. As it gets harder and harder to pump those last few drops out of the ground, the re energy return on investment for petroleum will continue to decline. And with the decline in supply, that means a rise in price. Uh, many pessimistic uh, economists look at this and call it the long emergency, a global economic collapse as it becomes more expensive, not only to produce the oil, but also to transport virtually all other goods throughout the world, because most of our ships and transport planes are powered by, you guessed it, petroleum products. So everything uh, will get expensive, not just the gas you, price you pay at the pump, but that head of lettuce you buy at the grocery store is going to cost more because it will cost the trucking company more money to pump diesel into their truck, to bring it to your supermarket. Um, many to predict people will abandon the suburbs and move back into the cities and suburbs will become the new slums. People will move to neighborhoods where more services and shopping are available within walking distance, so they won't have to spend the expensive uh, money they have to lay out to power their cars. Other more optimistic observers say technology will come to the rescue. Conservation efforts as well as alternative energy supplies uh, will kick in, we will develop some alternative fuel, uh, whether that's ethanol or hydrogen, that will step up and take its place. And this will save us from major disruptions. Now there are a number of other sources of fossil fuels besides those big three. These include things like oil sand. These are sandy deposits that contain a tar-like substance in it, in it that can be uh, processed and converted to fuels similar to the fuels we get from crude oil. And these are mined through strip mining process, practices, so they uh, have many of the same environmental impacts as strip mining for coal does. And these oil sand deposits are primarily found in Venezuela and Canada. Another fossil fuel is called oil shale. This is a sedimentary rock that again contains a tar-like substance that can be processed to produce a form of petroleum. Um, this is found in places like the United States, particularly in states like Nevada, on federally owned land. And supplies of oil shale may equal 600 billion barrels of oil. But like oil sands, the mining of oil shale does come with many environmental impacts, similar to other forms of mining. Methane hydrate are molecules of methane that are trapped in water ice molecules in the seafloor sediments. These are abundant. However, uh, right now it's not economically feasible. They cost more than you can get 
this material out on the commercial market. So if a more efficient manner of harvesting this material gets discovered, this might be a viable source of energy, but for the near future, it's likely to remain inefficient and very expensive. And as I mentioned, these have their downside. All of these alternative fossil fuels have downsides. They often have low energy return on investments, about three to one compared to the current EROI of five to one for crude oil. And they generate many environmental impacts, including damage to the landscape and water pollution. And they generate as many, as much atmospheric pollution as these other fossil fuels do. And they also release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which means they will contribute to climate change. And that's one of the biggest problems with all forms of fossil fuels. They generate air pollutants. These include sulfur, um, heavy metals like mercury, and carbon dioxide. Comparing them individually, oil generates some of the most pollutants. It's considered the dirtiest of the fossil fuels. While natural gas is considered the least dirty or least polluting of the energy sources. Fossil fuel use also generates water pollution. These include leaking underground storage tanks, non-point sources from oil pollution, including leaking from boats, leaking uh, from motor oil from vehicles, tanker oil spills, the devastating oil spill in the Gulf from the drilling deck accident. Coal mining contributes to acid mine drainage and drilling also requires roads and infrastructure to get at the resource, which can lead to fragmenting of habitats. And that brings us back to the question of Anwar. Will drilling in Anwar meet our needs for petroleum while at the same time minimizing its environmental impact? Uh, critics of drilling in Anwar point to the many environmental impacts, including killing vegetation, the impact on air and water quality, as well as the breeding ground for uh, many species, including the porcupine caribou. Proponents of drilling in Anwar point to the fact that, well, we've learned a lot since we started drilling in Alaska in the 70s, and we can use some more environmentally sensitive technology and approaches that will reduce our overall footprint. But, um, the question remains, will this petroleum supply meet our needs? And the first thing we have to look at is the, simply the fact that the U.S. is a major importer of oil. We import about two-thirds of our oil, which means that other nations have a big lever to put on our energy supplies. And we've seen the impact of this over the years, particularly in the past 40 years. OPEC, which stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, have had uh, the ability to influence the price we pay for oil and that we pay at the pump. In particular, in the 1970s, they instituted an oil embargo against countries that supported the United uh, supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, keep in mind, most of the members of OPEC are Middle Eastern nations. And during the Yom Kippur War, many of those countries were at war with Israel. So you can picture Israel, a country about the size of New Jersey, at war with just about all of its neighbors. And you know, if you know who Israel's biggest supporter is, it's the United States. So here we are, it's the early 1970s. The U.S. has reached its peak of oil production and need, needs to import more 
oil from other countries. And then one of the biggest organizations of oil exporters says, we're not going to sell any more oil to you. And that caused a huge spike in the price of oil. And then another spike occurred during the Iranian Revolution, and a second embargo was put on the U.S. Other spikes occurred when we had the first Gulf War in the early 1990s, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and when Hurricanes Katrina and Rita struck the Gulf Coast, which disrupted the supply of oil, not so much because we weren't able to drill and produce the oil, but because we had many refineries there, and those refineries were taken out of commission for a while, and therefore many petroleum products were unable to be brought to market, including gasoline. So this has caused many, many increases in the price we pay at the gas pump. And it will continue to hurt us as long as we are dependent on importing oil. Now, the funny thing is, is the U.S. doesn't actually uh, import most of the oil it gets from the Middle East. In fact, we import more oil from Canada and Mexico than we do from the Middle East. However, because oil is an international commodity, it's sold at one global price. So anything that disrupts the price of oil in one place, anything that disrupts the ability to produce oil in one part of the world causes shockwaves, which raises the price everywhere in the world, even if we weren't buying it directly from where the disruption is occurring. And we also find ourselves in many strange relationships. Uh, for example, Saudi Arabia, a country known for having some really bad human rights uh, violations is considered a close U.S. ally because they control 22% of the world's oil reserves. And that's one of the prices we pay for being dependent on oil. We uh, involve ourselves militarily in that region again and again. And we really cannot separate our involvement in the war, whether we're looking at Iraq or Iran, or Afghanistan, or any other part of that region of the world, we, can, we cannot separate it from oil, because anything we do in there has an impact. And if we ignore it and let things blow up, uh, it could have a major impact on our economy. This is, again, one of the reasons why uh, in recent years, there was an effort to depose uh, Gaddafi in Libya. It was because it, his disruption and the uh, crisis going on there during the rebellion threatened supply of oil, not really to the United States, but to Europe. And so the U.S. and our NATO allies led a coalition to oust Gaddafi once and for all so that we could continue to have supply of oil flowing to the industrialized world. So, in order to minimize our impact that foreign oil has on the U.S., we have tried to diversify our supply of oil, develop our own reserves, drilling in places like the Gulf of Mexico, uh, drilling in more areas of Alaska, although we haven't tapped in more yet. Uh, we do import oil from many different countries so that one, no one single country can put a stranglehold on our oil supply. Stockpiling oil in what we call the strategic petroleum oil. And putting money into renewable energy sources and conservation efforts. Um, one of the things about oil is whether or not the local residents have an economic benefit. Uh, for example, in Alaska, the oil companies pay the government fees to drill on state land. And this is actually the primary source of money for Alaska's state budget, so much so that Alaska actually has reverse taxation, where most years its residents get money back from the government instead of paying state income tax to their state government. 
the state gives residents money back because they get more money from the petroleum company than they spend for their state budget. In other places, including uh, many countries in Africa, local residents do not receive any compensation for the drilling going on 